Guten Morgen. Uh, thank you very much to the uh, Jerry and Steve Toon for the invitation. As, uh, as Mr. Döring said, uh, my presentation is more like a broad uh, introduction to the whole issue of emerging economies and what's going on, what's happened in the last, let's say, 15 to 10 years, and where we're headed, what could, could we expect in the next decade uh, about this uh, phenomenon that certainly deserves our attention. I will I'll start by saying that we should go back some 15 years ago, some 15 years ago, the prospects for the developing world weren't that bright. Uh, they would actually would seem to dim. In Latin America, we had a major crisis in Argentina and Brazil. Uh, those crises represented the era, the end of the era of reforms of the 1990s, and led to a half decade of, of, of stagnation, of basically no growth. In Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, that region continued to be mired by extreme poverty, predatory governments, over indebtedness. The stagnation and lack of opportunities in the Arab world strengthened terrorist groups that will, whose actions will define the decade ahead. ahead. And the much celebrated Asian Tigers, once an example of breathtaking economic development, were brought to their needs in an acute currency crisis. So this is what we had basically uh, 15 years ago. It didn't, it didn't look that bright. One notable exception, of course, uh, was China. We already had a very uh, substantive, uh, substantive uh, presentation about uh, the phenomenon of, of, of China. Soon after, uh, Deng Xiaoping decided to open uh, China to the world. In the late 1970s, China achieved double-digit growth that lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. According to an estimate by the World Bank, 680 million people have been lifted out of poverty since 1981. This is a phenomenon that we will never see again in the history of mankind. And it has definitely had a huge impact, not only for China, but for the whole world, particularly for the rest of the developing world. Why? Because as China grew and as China became richer, it gobbled up raw materials to fuel its, its export-led growth. Commodity prices soared, boosting the economies of many Latin American and African countries. The admission of China as a full member of the World Trade Organization in 2000 was sort of a coming of age for the country as a powerhouse in the world economy. Additionally, East Asian economies quickly recovered from the downturn in the, from the 1997 uh, crisis. So developing countries back in the uh, early last decade were growing at a faster pace than the developed counterpart, co counterparts. On the other hand, there was also another uh, giant in Asia that was opening up for business, which was China. Uh, economic reforms in 1991 partially dismantled what they called the license budget a regime of burdens on regulations and licenses that strangle economic activity. The reforms induce a period of high growth and a corresponding drop in poverty. By 2001, Jim O'Neill, then chief economist at Goldman Sachs, will coin the acronym BRIC to identify the four large countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, that encompass over 40% of the world population and whose fast-growing economies best represent the beginning of a new era of emerging markets. During that golden era, that golden decade, between 2001 and 2012, advanced economies grew on average a paltry 1.6% a year, while the 154 economies <coughs> defined as emerging by the International Monetary Fund expanded by 6.2% a year. This, is, uh, this was actually a new phenomenon. Back uh, until then, uh, advanced economies will grow, and uh, most of the time will grow uh, faster uh, than uh, developing countries, which no longer we're talking about third world, actually. Now, now we're talking <coughs> about emerging economies. The impact of high growth rates led by China and subsequently followed by India and other emerging economies, has been dramatic. In the last 20 years, the proportion of people living below the poverty line in developing countries has declined by half, 
dropping from 43% in 1990 to 21% in 2010. In the same period, child mortality worldwide went down by 40%, and average life expectancy increased by more than four years. People are living longer and healthier lives. And for the first time in history, we can actually talk about the possibility of living in a world without poverty. It is worth noting that an expanding global economy and not government activism is a driving force behind this unprecedented progress. A recent study by World Bank economists David Dollar, Art Craig, and Tatiana Feinenberg shows that nearly 80% of the improvement in the incomes of the 40s, poorest 40% 40 in 118 countries is a result of economic growth and not redistribution programs. So, so far, so good. However, many people assume that the good times were here to stay. And given the serious problems facing developed countries, it is reasonable to expect that emerging economies will continue to up outperform uh, the rich world in the, in the years ahead. But the latest data from the IMF suggests that growth in emerging economies is decelerating. Some of it has to do with the troubles of the rich world. Despite talk of developing countries decoupling from developed countries, the truth is that the pervasive crisis in the Eurozone and the United States lackluster recovery is having an impact on emerging markets. Additionally, many countries, big and small, the golden decade also contributed to a lack of urgency for the implementation of further economic reforms. That's one of the downsides of this uh, high pe uh, period of high growth, and we will see that <coughs> later in my talk. The challenge ahead for emerging economies is how to reignite high growth rates while facing, and in some instances, resisting political demands from segments of the population that have become accustomed to rising living standards. In many cases, these demands call for the provision of supposedly free government goods and services, such as healthcare or education, which in reality must be financed through higher public spending. We'll talk about that later too. But before we can ask, ask, properly assess and address lagging growth, we must answer first some questions about what made the last decade so golden. Was it a unique episode whose time is up? Was the rise of China and to a lesser degree India the leading factor behind the rapid growth of other emerging economies? Or were market friendly reforms the main cause? And most importantly, can emerging economies what can emerging economies do to cope with a global slowdown? Let's go first to the sources of growth. When the acronym BRIC was first coined in 2001, it grew a disparate set of countries that did not have much in common, besides the large size of the economies. And last night we had a dinner where we were actually discussing that. If you look at what was behind the growth of China, or Brazil, or Russia, and or India, there isn't much in common out there. On the one hand, China and India were reaping the fruits of market reforms implemented years earlier, which transformed their economies. Even though the reforms were far-reaching, there is still plenty of room for further liberalization. For example, despite talk of China undergoing a capitalist revolution, the country still dwells in the bottom quartile of the Fraser Institute Economic Freedom of the World Report. This is a report that uh, we publish every year. The, uh, the, the Liberalist Institute here in Germany, the Cato Institute in the United States, is, is produced by economists uh, in the United States. And it ranks countries according to their institutions uh, and how they uh, deal with economic freedom, whether they have uh, large governments, whether they have uh, stable currencies, uh, the, the protection of property rights, uh, how free trade, uh, how pervasive is free trade, uh, the regulations. So it's like a, the ranking of FIFA, and it, it ranks like 154 economies, and if you look at, uh, at China, it's still in the bottom quartile of that economic freedom of the world report. So despite talk about China undergoing this capital revolution, we see that there is still plenty of room ahead, ahead for China to become actually a capitalist country. India is not far ahead. But the sheer size of both countries, which combine account for 36 of the world's population, magnify the economic impact of these reforms. 
On the other hand, Russia and Brazil, they both suffered crises in 1998 that were the result of policy mistakes that accompanied the, the reforms they implemented in the 1990s. In the case of Russia, poorly implemented reforms resulted in a transition from communism, that cap to, from communism to capitalism that was marred by political turmoil, financial st instability, and corruption. Russia never completed its transformation to a free market economy and became instead a standard bearer of chronic capitalism. And there is a picture there of the gas, gas pump, which is the, one of the leading uh, state uh, enterprises. As for Brazil, the macroeconomic reforms implemented by President Enrique Cardoso in 1994 under the Plano Real stabilized the economy, eradicated hyperinflation, and complemented the privatization of several state-owned enterprises. But with a new decade and a new government, the appetite for further reforms withered, and Brazil remains a fairly close economy. Again, in our Economic Freedom Index, Russia and Brazil are ranked as 101st and 102nd freest economies among 154 countries, respectively. Despite these shortcomings, both countries benefited enormously from the dramatic increase in the price of commodities that began in 2003. So as we can see, the patterns of growth and reform of the BRICS reflected that of many emerging economies. Some countries enjoy high growth because they reformed, uh, reforms that they implemented in the 1980s and 1990s, and some other emerging economies grew a lot because they simply benefited from the global headwinds of high commodity prices. It's a mixture, and I think that the BRICS uh, represent uh, this pretty well. The role of soaring prices of raw materials played in the golden decade cannot be underestimated. According to Ernesto Talvi and Ignacio Mujo of the Brookings Institution, from 2003 to 2008, the average price of commodities increased by 75% compared to the previous five-year period. Extractive industries and farming became the engines of growth in many countries in Latin America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. So let's look at a little bit uh, to each region to see what was going on, whether uh, countries benefited from the or benefited from, from this uh, uh, commodity boom. Latin America. In Latin America, the reforms commonly identified with the much reviled Washington Consensus laid the, actually laid the groundwork in the 1990s for macroeconomic stability, independent central banks, and to some degree, fiscal rectitude. Market reforms never implemented in, the, in their entirety, and that's something we have to keep in mind. It's not that the Washington Consensus was applied in its entirety by any Latin American country were often put in place reluctantly and inconsistently. For example, <coughs> some nations, such as Mexico, privatized inefficient state-owned monopolies in key industries, but in many cases did not open those sectors to competition, so they left in place private monopolies. Other countries, such as Argentina, adopted sound monetary policies that put an end to hyperinflation, but never ran in on public spending and eventually went bankrupt. As a result, the full potential of the reforms was never, never achieved in Latin America. Nevertheless, the overall macroeconomic situation of the region markedly improved compared with the turmoil of the 1980s. Latin America's average economic freedom score increased from 5.3 out of 10 in 1990 to 6.76 in 2000. The fact that most of the region enjoyed low levels of inflation, financial stability, and sound government finances during the golden decade has much to do with those reforms that they, they implemented, again, inconsistently and reluctantly in the 1990s. A special case is Chile, which began liberalizing its economy many years before there was even talk of the Washington Consensus. The comprehensiveness of Chile's reforms still has no parallel in Latin America, and it stands now as the freest economy in the region it is not a coincidence that Chile has more than tripled its income per capita since 1990, allowing it to claim the most impressive record in poverty reduction in Latin America. The poverty rate, rate fell from 45% in the, the mid-1990s to 14% in 2000. 
It is now on course to become the first developed nation in Latin America by the end of this decade. Approximately around 2016, they will reach the threshold, which is $22,000 per capita, that will certify them, basically, as a developed country. So Chile is well on, on pace to become the first con developed country of Latin America. Unfortunately, even though some countries such as Peru and El Salvador have tried to replicate Chile's success story, the march towards greater liberalization in most of Latin America came to a halt during the golden decade. The region's average economic freedom score in 2011, which was 6.67, was actually lower than in, 2000, than in 2000. If Latin America enjoyed a healthy growth rate of 4% a year between 2001 and 2012, it was because of the stability brought by the reforms in the 1990s and exceptionally high, exceptionally high commodity prices, which boosted the economies of most South American nations, from Brazil to Argentina to even Chile, Peru, Colombia, and so on. Let's take a look at Africa. Africa's growth is also an example of the mixture of reform and favorable external conditions. A continent that was for many decades synonymous with destitution and hopelessness went through a decade of high growth and economic transformation. The region grew an average of 5.5% a year between 2000 and 2012. And conventional wisdom holds that the commodity boom fueled by the demand of China was responsible for this surge in growth. But actually, the reality is more nuanced. A study from the McKenzie Global Institute found that only a third of Africa's economic growth between 2000 and 2008 could be credited to the extraction of natural resources. The other two-thirds came from internal structural changes, including more restrained monetary policies, a reduction in budget deficits and public debt, trade liberalization, privatization, and in many instances, tax cuts and regulatory reforms that improve the business environment. The continent has also undergone substantial transformation in sectors such as wholesale, retail, transportation, telecommunications, and manufacturing. Even China's interaction with Africa, which China has become the leading trade partner, belies the conventional wisdom that extractive industries are the leading engine of growth. According to a study by the International Monetary Fund in 2011, only 27% of China's direct investment in Africa has to do with mining. Much of the remaining investment went through the aforementioned dynamic sectors of manufacturing and services. However, this doesn't mean that Africa is about to replicate the success of the Asian tigers. The continent still suffers from kleptocrats, civil strife, and a few remaining failed states. Eight of the bottom ten countries in, the economic, in Fraser's economic freedom of the world report are African, and a third of the world's most impoverished people live in Africa. But the continent is now much better, in a much better position than it was over a decade ago, largely because of a series of domestic reforms and greater economic freedom. As the commodity boom subsides, one only hopes, and I will hope, that Africa will recognize the need for further liberalization. East Asia. Well, East Asia was home to the 20th century's, late 20th century's much celebrated success story, which was the rise of the Asian Tigers, a group of four countries, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and South Korea, whose high growth rates and rapid industrialization transformed them into developed countries in a relatively short period of time. The financial crisis of 1997 briefly put into question the progress of the Asian Tigers, but in the last decade, these economies rapidly reassumed growth, although at a, lower, a slower pace. In the last two decades, though, other countries in the continent, such as Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Malaysia, have also experienced an economic surge. These nations, whose combined populations total 432 million people, grew an average of 5.3% per annum between 1992 and 2012. East Asia leads the world in poverty reduction and a growing middle class is taking hold throughout the region. In the last decade, East Asia also successfully dealt with the rise of the region's behemoth, China. Many countries in the region have complemented 
their manufacturing capacities with those of their giant neighbor, establishing production chains throughout the Pacific Rim. Meanwhile, others, other <coughs> countries such as Indonesia and Malaysia also benefited tremendously from the commodity boom. Now, this is, I'm just talking about economically. And now, we, we just had a discussion about politically how these countries are extremely nervous about their uh, giant neighbor, but at least economically they successfully uh, uh, cope or, or complemented uh, their economies to the rise of China. South Asia, and more specifically China, uh, India. Despite significant progress, India is home to 42% of the world's poor. The work that best illustrates the social impact of economic reforms implemented in India was done by my Cato Institute colleague, Swaminathan Ayer. He found that in the early reforms of 1981, when, when, India, when India began opening up its economy in 1981, if those timid reforms of 1981 had been implemented a decade earlier, in 1971, those reforms that began dismantling the social controls dominant in India since independence, the ensuing, the ensuing higher growth rates will have lifted 109 million more Indians out of poverty. So just if those timid reforms of 1981 had taken place one decade earlier, 100 more Indians will have been lifted out of poverty. India's rise should thus be analyzed from the perspective of opportunities missed and opportunities taken. The reforms of the 1991 that partially liberalized the economy led to an average growth rate of 7.2% 7, 7 in the following decade. But the reformist drive ended with the return of power of the Congress party in 2005 at the onset of complacency. Uh, you can see this uh, cover from the uh, Economist magazine, uh, which was very optimistic and, and claiming that India would actually outpace uh, China in economic growth, but actually that never happened. China never, India never achieved China's uh, growth rate, and the extent of its poverty the re reduction has not been as impressive as that of China, but it is still quite large. In the last seven years, 138 million Indians left poverty. So this is just to, to illustrate how mild economic reforms or economic reforms implemented in, those, in these large countries have such a huge impact in the lives of millions of people. And one can only wonder what will happen if these countries, who are still among the, 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 the world's least open economies, least free economies, what will happen if they further liberalize their economies. A favorable demographic growth and the institutional strength that comes from being the world's largest economy provide a reason to be optimistic about India's future development, if only the leadership in New Delhi will gain back its appetite for further economic liberalization. Now let's talk about an issue that we already uh, discussed earlier, which is the China factor. And let's keep in mind that my talk was supposed to be introductory, so I might be repeating uh, some of the things that were said before. So there's no denying whatsoever that China is the central figure in the story of emerging economies. Between 1981 and 2012, China grew on average 9.7% a year. The swift expansion and its secondary effects on other nations is rapidly changing global dynamics. According to a projection by The Economist magazine, in 2019, China will overtake the United States as the world's largest economy using real exchange rates. Many pundits talk of, China, of the 21st century as the Chinese century, but we should keep in mind that China was the world's largest economy for centuries until it was overtaken in the 1900s by Western Europe. So as we saw earlier, China views its own rise more as reclaiming its rightful place as the world's leading economy after 100 years of humiliation. Just as China's rise has played a key role in fueling this golden decade, its deceleration constitutes a serious challenge for many countries whose economies have been propped up by the commodity boom. <coughs> after, the three after three decades of skyrocketing growth, 
China now faces the limits of a state-led export and investment model, as we saw earlier. The country too begin its transition to a consumer-led economy, which will require substantial domestic reform. And I will, I will add to what was discussed earlier that it is not clear whether the new president, uh, Xi Jinping, is committed to undertaking these reforms or even understands the need to implement them. There are many people in the Chinese government that do understand the need for reform and do know that we have to undertake these, these reforms, but it is not clear whether at least the president is in the same uh, boat. And as Professor said earlier, we will have to pay attention to the following Congresses and meeting in the next in the next months to see if there is a clear signal that China is moving in that direction. And whatever China does, it will have a, a huge effect on the whole world. When and how China implement these structure, structural changes, which should include lifting its stringent capital controls, privatizing most of its inefficient state-owned enterprises, and allowing the renminbi, the currency, to freely float against the dollar will determine China's prospects for consolidating itself as a global economic powerhouse. If these reforms are successfully implemented, it will confirm China's status as an engine of global growth. And as I said earlier, encouragingly, the possibilities for further liberalization are enormous. In that ranking, uh, the Fraser Institute's ranking of 152 economies, China is 123rd, uh, the previous economy. So there is a lot of room for China to liberalize its economy. Now, this is interesting because the rise of China has ignited and stimulated, stimulating uh, academic debate. And we had earlier a very stimulating talk about the, the whole issue of China. Much of this debate about China dwells on whether its rise will be peaceful or marked by military comfort, co conflict, as is often the case when you have a nation, a nation emerging as a global superpower. But there is also an interesting discussion on what was behind China's rapid development and what lessons it brings to other emerging economies. Unfortunately, some scholars and politicians have wrong have drawn the wrong lessons from China's rise arguing that it is the result of political authoritarianism and a state control economy, the authoritarian capitalist system that we discussed earlier. This interpretation of the causes of China's development could be called the Beijing Consensus. And unlike the Washington Consensus that we discussed earlier, it is not a set of policy recommendations, but rather a theory that states that economic development requires an activist government and a close political decision-making process. One of the leading cheerleaders of the Beijing Consensus is the New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman. Back in 2009, he wrote uh, an op-ed, he wrote a column where he possibly uh, applauded the great advantages of one-party autocracy when it is led by reasonable, enlightened people, such as is China today, he said. Friedman then contrasted Beijing's expedient decision-making process with Washington's constant political gridlock. And if you follow Washington politics, you've seen a lot of that lately. So the lesson, according to uh, Thomas Friedman, is simple. Autocracy can be efficient, whereas democracy, with all those pesky, uh, pesky check and balances, is not. So that's one pillar of this Beijing consensus. The other pillar is state capitalism. State-owned enterprises, the SOEs, account, account for 80% of China's stock market. And some of these companies have become leading world players. As The Economist magazine put it last year, and I quote, the Chinese no longer see state-directed firms as a way station on the road to liberal capitalism. Rather, they see it as a sustainable model. They think that they have redesigned capitalism to make it work better and a growing number of emerging world leaders agree with them. All of a sudden, state capitalism is uh, on, in vogue. The reality is much different, as we uh, heard earlier from Professor. Uh, the, real, 
the propon what the proponents of the Beijing or what the prop proponents of the Beijing consensus convey. Political authoritarianism is the source of human rights abuses, widespread corruption, and in the long run is incompatible with economic development. As Milton Friedman pointed out, economic freedom is a necessary condition for and is conducive to political freedom. As China's swelling, swelling middle class continues to prosper, the demands for greater political and civil liberties will grow as well. We have seen it in the past in countries such as diverse as Chile, Taiwan, Korea. Every time a dictatorship opens up its economy, grows, there is a growing middle class that eventually demands political freedom, civil liberties, and eventually that dictatorship collapses. So therefore, the big conundrum for the Chinese leadership right now is how to address the likelihood that further economic liberalization might lead to political liberalization. On the other hand, state capitalism is not the engine of China's fast-growing economy either. Instead, it is the, ser the, the source of serial malinvestment, pervasive cronism, and continued friction in the global trading system. Yeah, this is, the, the latter is a very important threat to the future of globalization because many developed countries, and we have seen that in the EU and, and in the United States, many developed countries resist the expansion of emerging countries' state-owned enterprises, many times through investment barriers or outright protectionist measures. Fortunately, the China is rapidly coming off state-owned enterprises. A report last year from the World Bank and the Development Research Center, which is a government-sponsored Chinese think tank, warned that the large role of state-owned enterprises represented a risk to the economy. As the financial burden of bad investments by Chinese state-owned enterprises becomes more apparent in the years ahead, their appeal as a model to be followed should greatly diminish. Emerging economies should firmly reject the lessons, the full lessons of the Beijing Consensus. But they also should meet other challenges that the golden decade has produced. And these are not few. And this is one of the uh, paradoxes of the good time. They, they were good, but they also created many challenges that we need to uh, face in the next decade. The golden decade brought about extraordinary growth rates and a significant decline in the poverty levels of developing countries, but it also bred complacency in many emerging economies. The urge for further liberalization, both domestically and globally, faded as political leaders believed that the good times were here to stay, that the golden decade was a new normal. So one of the victims of the good times was uh, the WTO's Doha Development Round, perhaps the greatest casualty of the good times. Launched in 2001, right after the terrorist attacks of September 11, the Doha Round aimed at significantly reducing trade barriers in agricultural and industrial goods, as well as services. Some estimates claim that a comprehensive Doha Round will add to the world economy approximately $500 billion a year. Nevertheless, it was clear from the beginning that large develop, developing countries, such as Brazil and India, and to a lesser extent China, were not as enthusiastic as others about opening up their markets to foreign goods. Their initial reluctance was emboldened by the high growth rates they enjoyed during the golden decade. They were growing fast, so what was the need for a, for a comprehensive Doha round? And the resistance, according to the view, was legitimized, legitimized their protectionist model. So they were like, well, we're growing fast, we're protectionists, we don't need growth of Doha. I mean, this is a proof that we don't need to liberalize our trade regimes. The unwillingness of developed countries to put a significant offer on the table to dismantle most of their agricultural subsidies also contributing to this ongoing impasse. A more ominous byproduct of the golden decade in certain countries was the consolidation of power by democratically elected autocrats whose purses were swollen during the commodity boom. In Latin America, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, Evo Morales in Bolivia, and Rafael Correa in Ecuador are prime examples of this phenomenon. 
But also in Africa, the high price, the high price of raw materials contributed to the survival of strongmen such as Jose Eduardo dos Santos in Angola, Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe, and Teodoro Obian in Equatorial Guinea. Fortunately, the golden decade has also coincided with the advance of democratic institutions on much of the developing world. So the jury is still out whether the golden decade actually was good for democracy or bad for democracy. I think that uh, there, there have been advances in a lot of places, but also serious setbacks in others. Another risk facing, and this is, this is one of the most interesting paradoxes of the golden decade, is ironically a direct result of the success of the golden decade. The emergence in many nations of a socially ambitious middle class grounded, grounded in a thriving private sector rather than government employment is one of the most positive developments of the golden decade. However, particularly in Latin America, the new middle class can also be the driving force behind demands for the further expansion of the welfare state. A worrisome example in Chile, as we saw before, Chile is the leading economy in Latin America. But there, a mostly middle, a mostly middle class student movement have staged large protests demanding free college tuition and the abolition of for-profit private education. The, that, the danger in these increasingly wealthier societies is that a false sense of prosperity can set in before their countries actually become rich. We're currently witnessing in Europe how a rampant welfare state can impoverish a nation. For example, by some definition, Greece is no longer a developed nation, but an emerging economy. In the case of developing countries, the demand for free goods and services from the government can easily derail the march towards progress. So avoiding this high expectations trap, as I would call it, is perhaps one of the greatest challenges facing emerging economies nowadays. I mean, the, many times the population wants to eat the cake before it is baked. The overall record of the golden decade is still highly positive. Despite the perils it brought about, a global economic slowdown also represents an opportunity to tackle some of these challenges head on. So what are the opportunities of the slowdown? The quest for reigniting growth will be a major task for emerging economies in the decade ahead. It is critical that developing countries reject the siren songs of conventional Keynesianism. After years of boom, many of these emerging countries have fairly positive fiscal and monetary standing with low budget deficits and debt levels, moderate inflation, and substantial foreign exchange reserves. They have a very solid macroeconomic standing right now. So this is generating a temptation in many of these countries for politicians to try to stimulate their economies through higher government spending and loose monetary policy. And we saw that with Brazil right after the uh, financial crisis of 2008. They lowered the interest rate trying to stimulate the economy just by simply injecting more money into the system. The result was an artificial burst of growth inevitably, inevitably followed by a rise in inflation and near economic stagnation. And we're going to hear from Hannah Klein, the general consul of Germany in Rio de Janeiro later about uh, Brazil. So the real path towards sustained growth, again, is further economic liberalization. From Indonesia to South Africa, from Vietnam to India, a large number of emerging economies postponed structural reforms during the golden decade. The nature of the needed reforms varies across countries and, and regions, so it's not easy to identify a single package of structural changes to be implemented. In Latin America, there is a great need for abolishing crippling business and labor regulations that stifle entrepreneurship and produce a large informal sector. African nations should privatize infrastructure and liberalize intra-regional trade. And many Asian economies should abolish stubborn barriers to trade and foreign direct investment. So there's no, uh, there's no uh, uh, homogeneous package of reform to be implemented in, across the world. But in the international context, 
we do have some issues that can be uh, dwelt with. Large emerging economies, such as India, China, and Brazil, should drop their objections to the Doha round and try to seek the most comprehensive deal available on agricultural and industrial goods as well as services. Otherwise, these countries risk being left behind by the consolidation of large free trade agreements, such as the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership that is currently being negotiated between the EU and the US, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Agreement, which is currently also being negotiated between the US and other uh, economies, including Japan in the Pacific Rim, and the Pacific Alliance, this new uh, free trade agreement or free trade area between Mexico, Chile, uh, Colombia, and Peru. These large trade packs are generally, generally a second best alternative given the impasse at the multilateral level. However, one obvious problem with the proliferation of FTAs is what Professor Jagdish Bhagwati of Columbia University has called the spaghetti bowl effect of so many trade free trade agreements with different rules of origin, different tariff schedules, and different non-tariff regulation. It's quite a mess. So ultimately, a comprehensive Doha round is the best case scenario for trade liberalization treaties. And emerging economies, particularly the BRICS, should be the leading voices in its pursuit and not the leading obstacles. Agriculture, and this is where I have a message for you guys here in the European, uh, uh, European Union. Agriculture is an area where dramatic improvements must also be made in the upcoming decades since the world needs to feed a growing and wealthier population. According to David Tillman of the University of Minnesota, demand for food will probably double by 2050. However, if that were to happen, and current crop yields stay the same, the world will also have to double the amount of, amount of arable land. That will have a significant environmental impact since 40% of the planet's land is already being used for agriculture. The technology needed to face this challenge already exists, and it is called genetically modified crops. Unfortunately, the European Union, which is the world's largest importer of agricultural products, has, paid, has placed stringent regulations on GM crops that have severely undermined its spread around the globe. The EU has also been active in exporting its anti-GM regulations to developing countries. We are developing assistance and trade agreements. A second green revolution with enormous economic consequences could be unleashed in the developing countries, in the developing countries, if the EU were to drop its unscientific opposition to GM crops. Finally, immigration is another area that can mutually benefit developed and emerging economies alike. According to Michael Clemens of the Center for Global Development, if all barriers to the free movement of people were removed, the estimated gains to the world economy will range between 50 to 150% of global GDP, which is huge. The idea, however, I know that the idea of unhindered movement of people worldwide is politically unrealistic. If anything, we're actually going backwards in many instances. But given that there are so many restrictions to immigration right now, even small reforms can have a significant economic impact. Emerging economies in particular stand to benefit from immigration as the people who leave send both money and good ideas back to their home countries to foster development. Therefore, therefore as we can see, the economic slowdown we face in the coming year represents a great opportunity for the world to deepen the free flow of goods, services, capital, and people among nations. In other words, this should be seen as a chance to accelerate the pace of globalization based on the ultimate goals of free markets and peace. To conclude, I think that Mark mentioned this earlier. As we can see, uh, this is a done by this is a graph done by uh, the late economist Angus Madison, and his work showed that for millennia, almost all of humanity lived in abject poverty until the end of modern growth began in the West at the start of the 19th century. In the last 20 years, 
we have witnessed the beginning of a similar phenomenon <coughs> of that of, that we saw with the rise of the West, but a much greater scale with the rise of emerging economies. And just as it was the case 200 years ago, higher growth and rising pro pro prosperity accompanied economic liberty. The basic liberal premises that Adam Smith identified as contributing to the wealth of nations continue to be valid today. This is the theory of moral sentiments of uh, 1754, where he uh, said little less, little less is requisite to carry a state to the highest degree of opulence from the lowest barbarism by peace, easy taxes, and a terrible administration of justice, all the rest being brought about by the natural course of, thing, of things. As we have seen, it has been the case uh, everywhere since modern growth uh, began in the early 19th century. And yet, skepticism toward free markets is still widespread. The false, false prophets of socialism and nationalism continue to preach the vir virtues of their ideologies, even though the evidence is overwhelming that long-term sustainable human progress requires greater levels of economic freedom. The prospects of living on a planet without extreme poverty and ever-increasing wealth are exciting. But if history is any guide, we should remain aware and vigilant of the dangers of gradual backsliding and even sweet reversals in the march to progress. As we have seen in the last decade, even good times can create serious challenges. The Jeffersonian ammunition that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance is similarly applicable to economic development. The price of increased prosperity is the constant defense of free market policies, which, as liberals, we well know, ultimately means the defense of individual freedom. So, thank you very much. <laughs>